Modern cars, while they're definitely faster and safer than classic vehicles, for at least some of us just don't offer that certain je ne sais quoi that the classic vehicles do. And perhaps one of the reasons why they don't is because they don't seemingly have that many innovative features unless you buy a really expensive vehicle. Back in the day, if you bought a mid-priced or even in some cases low-priced car, you had a few features that you could talk about with your friends. Not today where everything is pretty standardized and, and relatively vanilla. Let's talk about the top 10 features of some classic cars. And feel free to share in the comment section if you have any others that you think are innovative. Let's begin with number 10, and that is Buick's drop-in license plate introduced on the 1985 Electra. When Buick downsized its Electra for the 1985 model year, many within the company were worried that the car wasn't going to sell because it was so much smaller than its rear-wheel drive predecessor. In fact, the C-body platform, as it was known internally, actually had a nickname for this. They called it seasickness. They were worried, again, that the sales were just going to drop off given the gas prices had fallen significantly by the time this car was introduced versus the anticipated gas prices when it was originally planned. However, the 1985 Electra and the 1985 GMC bodies proved very, very successful in the marketplace, despite some admitted teething problems. And the Buick was a bit of an oddball when it came to the C-bodies, having its reverse opening clamshell style hood, which, by the way, they were also supposed to have a similar opening trunk. But it did not get that in the final version of production. But one innovative feature that the 1985 Electra did get was a drop-in license plate holder. As opposed to screwing your license plate in with, well, screws or in some cases little bolts, the Buick license plates of this era are simply drop in. You open the trunk lid and you remove the plate and then you put a new plate in and when you close the trunk lid the plate is locked in place and can't go anywhere. It was a great feature that was rather innovative although people don't change license plates very often but it certainly made it simple in the event that you did. Let's move on to number nine and that is lamp monitors. In other words, monitors that enabled you to tell if your lights were working or not. These often appeared on a number of high-end vehicles for various years. You can see here, this is the style that was employed on Cadillacs. This is from a 1976 Eldorado. And these were fiber optic lamp monitors. The outermost lamp there would enable you to see if your turn signal was working, the middle light if your headlight was working, and the blue light if your bright lights were working. There were also lamp monitors in the rear that enabled you to see if the tail lights were working or not. Cadillac wasn't the only one that had lamp monitors on its vehicles. Certainly as optional equipment, Buick did and other GM divisions did as well. Chrysler was also big into lamp monitors, although usually just for turn signals and not for headlights and bright lights. Ford also employed lamp monitors. The 1969 Lincoln Mark III had them in the rear only, by the way, and not in the front. But these were just an interesting little talking feature for your friends to show them how cool your car was, but they also were quite functional. You could tell if you had a turn signal bulb out. You often knew if you had a headlight out or not because you'd be missing half of your light shining down the road, but it was frequently hard to tell if a turn signal was out without getting out and looking at it. And these were a great innovative feature that you really just don't see anymore on vehicles. Let's move on to number eight, and that is cornering light. Now, some modern vehicles do still have cornering lights, but they're often integrated into the front fascia or into the overall bumper setup up front. And rarely do you see them on the side of the vehicle any longer. But back in the day, cornering lights were a relatively common option, or in some cases, even standard equipment. And they were first introduced in 1962 on Cadillacs. Now, Cadillac had cornering lights for a number of years, and I think the biggest and best cornering lights have to be those that are on the 1975 to 78 Eldorado, which took up like half of the fender area, as well as what I believe is the only double lamp or cornering light, which was offered on the 1974 Cadillacs. I don't believe any other cornering light from the classic car era had two lights on either side. But these were not only cool, but also functional. You could see around the corner better when you were turning and they provided better illumination when you are going down a road and making a turn. Again, some modern vehicles have these, but 
they're not as prominent as they once were. And I think that was part of the charm of the classic vehicles is that you could actually see the cornering light and you could watch it function. Let's move on to number seven, at which point we have liquid tire chain, an option offered only on 1969 Chevrolets and only about 2,600 takers elected this option when ordering their vehicle. If you lived in a snowy climate back in the day, a lot of times you often had to go and get snow tires for your rear-wheel drive vehicle. And some people didn't do that, or they just tried to muscle through the snow with their regular tires, in which case they weren't all that successful in driving. Or perhaps you just wanted some extra traction even on your snow tires. Well, if you wanted that in 1969 and you were buying a Chevrolet, you could order liquid tire chain, option V75. And here you can see a canister of the liquid tire chain. The idea was that there were two canisters, one on either side of the vehicle in the trunk when you elected this option, that would spray this liquid tire chain on the rear wheels and it would provide them with some extra traction and you could get out of a snowy or icy situation. It was, as I said, not a popular option, despite the fact that it actually worked decently well, I believe, but it was something that was only around for one model year and not many people got the benefit of trying it out. And number six, we have another feature that is often found on modern vehicles, but was certainly revolutionary back in the day, and that is the illuminated entry system. Here you can see a picture from the 1976 Cadillac brochure of the illuminated entry system. And one of the things that it did was when you pushed the door handle, it would illuminate the interior lights for a period of time, about 15 to 20 seconds. But the cool thing about this particular illuminated entry system is that it's shown a light on the lock cylinder on the exterior of the vehicle so you could actually see where to put your key in. Now, Cadillac did this in a number of ways. They had this light that was integrated into the door handle. Later, they would actually have the lock cylinder itself illuminate, which Ford also did on some vehicles. But overall, this was a great feature for people who were trying to get into their car. Not only could you see what was in the interior of your car before you got in, you also could appropriately put your keys in. Nowadays, you really don't have to use your keys. You just walk up to the vehicle and push a button and enter. But back in the day when you had to find your keys and find the keyhole, especially on a dimly lit area of the street, this was a wonderful, handy feature that enabled you to put the key in the hole and not scratch up your door or the overall lock cylinder. Let's move on to number five, at which point we have American Motors desert-only air conditioning setup. If you ordered air conditioning on an American Motors vehicle in the 1960s and 1970s, you always got what was this interesting setting that you can see here from a Javelin that it says desert only. The air conditioning setups on American Motors cars were a little bit different than others. American Motors obviously trying to save a little bit of money, and I don't believe that any of their vehicles had HVAC systems with vacuum-operated damper doors. They were often pretty complicated Bowden cables. And consequently, if you wanted to regulate the temperature of the AC, there wasn't a way on AMCs to blow and mix hot air in with the cool air-conditioned air. You would just move this lever to colder and to the desert-only point if you wanted the AC to be colder, and that would just lock the compressor on more frequently as opposed to it cycling on and off with greater intensity. The desert-only portion came in because that would basically just lock the compressor on full-time and if you were living in a very humid climate, the evaporator would freeze up. So you couldn't put it in that setting, as I said, if you were living anywhere other than the desert, because once the evaporator freezes, you just don't have any cooling power. It's an interesting and innovative approach, and frankly, it works. I have a 71 AMC Ambassador, and it really does work. The AC cycles on and off if you want it less cold, although it is a bit annoying when it cycles off, the air gets a bit more humid. But... It still is functional, kind of like aftermarket AC, and it worked for the AMC buyers of the time period, and the AC is definitely damn cold when you put it close to the coldest setting without going into desert only, especially for me because I don't live in the desert. Now, at number four, we have Cadillac's ECM, or Engine Control Module, readout, which was a feature of Cadillac's from the early 80s to about the mid-1990s. What this feature did was enable you to step through all the various engine computer parameters by depressing the often warmer buttons, as I am here, 
it would enter a diagnostic mode. You can see the service now and service soon lights are coming on. And then any codes would be displayed. And while that was cool, the perhaps best thing about this setup was that after the codes were displayed, you could push a button and then you could step through all the various engine parameters and read them to see if they read something interesting. So here, I believe you push the reset button, then you can see the display changes to 0 0.90. And then as you push the fuel used or the instant average button, you start stepping through various engine sensors. So this is the throttle position sensors. I depress the gas. You can see that it moved. That's the barometric pressure sensor. You can see as I step on the gas, it's also moving. Not sure what parameter three is. Can't recall, but parameter four is engine temperature in degrees Celsius. So just a very handy way of going through and figuring out if you have any issues. And parameter that I'm going through now, 1.1 is engine RPM. So 680 RPM, you got to multiply by 10. And on this display, it only goes up to 2000 RPM because the leading digit is a one. But it's still cool. Later Cadillac displays, you could read RPM much higher. As I said, this was a feature of Cadillacs from the early 80s through the mid 90s. It actually got progressively more intelligent. You could not only just step through the engine parameters, but you could force things like transmission upshifts or the torque converter clutch to lock up, or you could even shut off single injectors to diagnose if you had a dripping injector. So really an advanced setup for the time. The setup I just showed you, in fact, was from my 84 Seville. So you can see really was quite advanced and a really nifty setup if you're trying to diagnose your vehicle. At number three, we have something that exists on some modern cars today, and that's headlamp washers. Now, Chrysler offered headlight washers from 1969 to 1973, and some other auto companies also offered headlight washers on these classic vehicles. I believe Chevrolet even had headlight washers as an option in the late 60s. But the Chrysler setup, at least in my mind, is pretty gosh darn cool. It's vacuum actuated, and when you would depress the windshield washer button for three seconds, and the windshield washer would be deployed. It would also deploy these headlamp washers and this cool brush, which was black, on the low beam only headlights. It was something that was a novel feature for the time and frankly worked pretty well so long as you didn't have a vacuum leak. But again, it operated in conjunction with the windshield washer setup and just was a cool feature. I frankly wish more cars had them today outside of the luxury field, but they simply do not. At number two, we have yet another one-year-only option, the 1969 Dodge Superlight. Dodge introduced this Superlight on the top of its line vehicles as a $50 option, and it really was quite an innovative idea. It was effectively a small light that was placed inboard of the bright light on the driver's side. There was an auxiliary driving lamp enabling a driver to see a bit further down the road. This lamp, as opposed to the typical halogen sealed beam lamps, used a quartz iodine bulb giving an extended controlled light beam pattern that illuminated the road in a significantly improved way. And the intent of the super light was that this light beam pattern would illuminate the right side of the road and extend well beyond the low beams. Its pattern was low and to the right in order not to distract oncoming drivers and Frankly, it worked quite well, but it just was not accepted by the public, and so it was dropped after the 1969 model year. However, despite being dropped, the Super Light remains one of the coolest options that you could get on a top-of-the-line Dodge during the time, and also one that many people don't know about. And let's finish up with what I think is one of the coolest features of classic vehicles, and the Mopar fans are going to love me because it's another Mopar item. That is Chrysler's front and rear air conditioning as well as heating. If you've ever driven a modern car and then driven a classic vehicle with air conditioning that's charged on R12, you'll notice that the classic vehicle's air conditioning is frankly way better than a new vehicle's. You can hang meat in classic vehicles when you have the air conditioning working correctly and charged on R12, something that you just can't do anymore for whatever reason. But regardless, and for whatever reason, Chrysler thought that in the late 1960s and early 1970s on its luxury cars, 
It wasn't enough to have freezing cold air conditioning coming out from vents just in the front of you. They had an optional rear passenger air conditioner as well. Now, other makes had rear air conditioning in limousines, but not in passenger cars. In the Imperial, when you ordered this rear air conditioning, you got these extra two vents that were on the rear package shelf that would blow air conditioning out at the back of the rear passengers. It was an absolutely frigid air conditioning system. And by the way, that rear setup took a fair amount of space in the trunk. But regardless, if you really wanted to be icy cold, you would order this rear air conditioning setup and you could hang meat in about 20 seconds when you flip the switch on after starting up your Chrysler on a very, very hot day. And you could also order rear seat heat if you wanted to get extra heat back there. Chrysler was really innovative in this area, and I haven't seen this before or since, And I, aside from some super, super expensive luxury cars, but just a really unique and cool feature and one that Chrysler did very well. Its air temp system was a great one. The V-twin compressor alone, if you just had the front set up, was super cold. But if you get the front and back air conditioning, it's just an amazing place to be on a hot summer day. Thanks for watching this video on the top 10 features of classic cars. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any other suggestions, put them in the comments section. Also be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.